Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. The Indian Council of Medical Research is looking to launch the COVID-19 vaccine developed by Bharat Biotech known as Covaxin by the 15th of August. See, recently, the Hyderabad-based Bharat Biotech became the first pharmaceutical company of India to have developed a vaccine candidate for COVID-19 known as Covaxin. This indigenously developed vaccine candidate has shown a lot of potential to tackle COVID-19 and recently it has obtained the approval of the Drug Controller General of India to go for phase 1 and phase 2 of clinical trials. Even experts believe that Covaxin has shown sufficient potential to offer his immunity against COVID-19 but even before trials could begin and even before its efficacy and safety could be tested through clinical trials. The ICMR has directed Bharat Biotech to complete the trials as soon as possible and launch the vaccine by the 15th of August. These directions of the ICMR has led experts and scientists to question whether such deadlines can be set for vaccine development. Because developing a vaccine that to against an infectious disease is going to be a time intensive and resource intensive exercise because it has to be ensured that due process has been followed with utmost scientific rigor in order to test out the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine in a foolproof manner. See, it's a well-known fact that vaccine development takes months and years of effort and for a number of diseases, a vaccine may never be found even after decades of effort as seen in the case of HIV AIDS. See, the biggest hurdle to successfully developing a vaccine is to conclusively prove the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine. And this can be done only through a scientific, rigorous and time-consuming exercise known as RCTs or randomized control trials. Over the last three months, we have spoken about RCTs sufficiently and by now we know that these trials are a time-intensive and resource-intensive exercise but they will help us in conclusively establishing the safety and the efficacy of the drug or the vaccine. See, Bharat Biotech obtained approval for Phase 1 and Phase 2 clinical trials just a few days back from the Drug Control General of India. As of now, it has identified 12 hospitals across the country where the trials can be conducted and currently it is in the process of obtaining the required clearances by the Ethics Committee. And once these required clearances are obtained, then it can begin the process of recruiting the volunteers at these identified test sites. Then while recruiting these volunteers or test candidates, it has to be ensured that the sample size is as diverse as possible. And once these initial steps are completed, then phase one of the trial can begin, during which the possible side effects or adverse reaction of the drug or the vaccine is tested out on the test candidates who have voluntarily signed up for the clinical trials. Once the efficacy of the vaccine candidate is relatively established during phase one trials, the trials will progress to phase 2 during which the efficacy of the drug or the vaccine is tested out. In the case of a vaccine, efficacy is nothing but the ability of the vaccine candidate to help the test candidate to develop antibodies or immunity against the disease. In a number of cases, phase 1 and phase 2 of the trials do not provide conclusive results and hence the trials progress to phase 3 and phase 4 which further ends up consuming more time and more resources. Then once the safety and the efficacy of the drug or the vaccine is established, the findings of these trials is thoroughly studied and analyzed and they are finally published and this data will be further peer reviewed for further scrutiny. So as you can see, the development of a vaccine and its trials through RCTs can be a very rigorous exercise that is based on strict scientific norms and while following such due process, it might be hard or impossible to meet such unrealistic deadlines. However, the ICMR has clarified that the August 15th deadline is not a hard deadline and it is just a tentative date by which ICMR is looking to introduce the vaccine into the market. But either ways, experts and scientists agree that such unrealistic deadlines cannot be set for vaccine development as it could exert undue pressure on the pharmaceutical company. This could push the company to look for shortcuts during the trial process and it might try to bypass scientific rigor and the due process, which might threaten 
the safety of the volunteers and the patients who might be administered with the vaccine. Any possible adverse reaction due to the failure to follow due process might cause the public to lose trust and faith in the system of modern medicine itself. So experts are of the opinion that the ICMR should realize that when it comes to vaccine development, there are no shortcuts. Next, we have an editorial on page number 6 related to the Enrica Lexi case. And we also have a related article on page number 8. See, yesterday, we spoke about the Enrica Lexi case in detail. We understood the background. We understood the ruling of the permanent court of arbitration. And we also spoke about the maritime boundaries and jurisdiction as defined under the UN clause. And we also understood the impact of piracy in the Horn of Africa region and the impact of the redrawal of the high-risk area line closer towards the Indian coast. But today, we shall talk about the impact of the PCA's ruling in the Enrica Lexi case on India's interests. And we shall also understand the legal and diplomatic lessons that India needs to draw from the Enrica Lexi incident. See, as we discussed yesterday, the permanent court of arbitration has held that both India and Italy have concurrent jurisdiction over the Enrica Lexi case and both countries have the right to press criminal charges against the two Italian Marines. But the PCA has held that India's jurisdiction stands nullified because the Italian Marines enjoy immunity for being state representatives of the Italian government and hence India loses jurisdiction over the case and it cannot proceed to press criminal charges against them. But please remember the Permanent Court of Arbitration has not let the Italian Marines go free. It has only recognized that both countries had concurrent jurisdiction, but India's jurisdiction of the case has been nullified because of the immunity enjoyed by the Italian Marines. So this means that the PCA has recognized the jurisdiction of the Italian government over the case, and hence now Italy would be obligated to press criminal charges against the Marines and prosecute them as per Italy's domestic law. While delivering this award, the PCA has recognized that the freedom of navigation of the fishing vessel from Kerala had been violated and considering the physical and moral damage caused by the shooting incident, the victims and their families were eligible to be paid compensation by the Italian government. But overall, this ruling of the PCA comes as a major legal and diplomatic setback for India because India has lost complete jurisdiction over the case and according to the editorial, the Enrica Lexi case was well within India's jurisdiction. And hence, considering the sequence of events, the Italian Marines had to be kept in Indian custody and prosecuted under India's domestic laws. But now, India has lost this opportunity due to the failure of the Indian government to overcome the legal and diplomatic hurdles posed by international law and the diplomatic pressure exerted by the Italian government. See, the editorial says that, there was sufficient evidence available in the case to indicate that the incident took place in Indian waters under Indian jurisdiction as defined under the UN clause. But due to the failure of the Indian government to navigate the legal hurdles posed by international law and to overcome the diplomatic pressure exerted by the Italian government, and as a result, the case has now slipped out of India's jurisdiction and it is no longer in a position to deliver justice to the victims of this incident. The editorial says that India made three major mistakes in this case. The first mistake was that India initially tried to treat this as an anti-piracy case. Instead, had India tried this as a regular case that had taken place in Indian waters under Indian jurisdiction and had if the government gone for a quick speedy trial, it would have allowed the Indian government and the Indian legal and judicial system to overcome the legal hurdles posed by international law and the diplomatic pressure that was being exerted by Italy. See, the mistake of treating this as an anti-piracy case was committed by the NIA or the National Investigation Agency. The NIA initially booked the Italian Marines under the suppression of unlawful acts against safety of maritime navigation and fixed platforms on Continental Shelf Act of 2002. This act is usually used to bring up charges against pirates who threaten commercial shipping within India's Continental Shelf region. This legislation, which is primarily focused on anti-piracy, carries the provision of death penalty for committing murders on the high seas. And the possibility of the Italian Marines facing the death penalty in India invited a harsh response 
from the Italian government and as well as from the European Union. Italy, which happens to be a key member of the European Union, managed to exert pressure on the other European countries and the European Union threatened to impose trade sanctions against India if it continued to press death penalty charges against the Italian Marines. This not only weakened India's case and opened up India to unnecessary diplomatic pressure, but it also derailed India's focus from conducting a quick regular trial. These delays caused by legal hurdles and diplomatic pressure allowed the Marines to obtain orders from India's Supreme Court to leave the country, which further weakened India's case. Now, the PCA's ruling has made it clear that the piracy angle has been completely ruled out. In fact, Italy was trying to bring in the piracy angle to strengthen its case at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Italy's argument was that India had violated Article 100 of UN Clause by forcefully intercepting the ship which was in international waters and by forcing it back to Indian territorial waters. And according to the Italian government, this act of India disrupted the anti-piracy operations of the Italian Marines. Because see, under Article 100 of UN Clause, all the member countries are obligated to cooperate with each other in order to enable anti-piracy operations. During the hearings, Italy claimed that due to India's interception of the ship and due to India detaining the Italian Marines, their anti-piracy mission was disrupted and hence Italy wanted India to be held guilty for violating Article 100 of the UN Clause. But after examining the sequence of events and the evidence made available by India and Italy, the PCA has completely ruled out the piracy angle. So this means that even the permanent court of arbitration has seen this as a regular case that occurred on the high seas. It has ruled out any connection between the case and anti-piracy operations. So this would mean that between 2013 and 15, had India proceeded with the case swiftly and had India not committed these initial legal mistakes, it could have tried this case as any other regular case in its own courts under its domestic laws. And through creative diplomacy, if India had overcome Italy's diplomatic pressure, India could have succeeded in securing justice to these victims as per the provisions of Indian law within the jurisdiction of the Indian judicial system. But due to these initial failures, India has today lost jurisdiction over the case and the only thing that India can do right now is to ensure that it will follow up with the Italian government to ensure that the Marines are prosecuted under Italy's domestic laws and ensure that adequate compensation is paid by the Italian government to the victims of this incident. Next, in a related article on page number 8, the government of India has informed the Supreme Court to close the pending case because India intends to respect the award of the PCA and abide by its instructions. See, under the UN clause, maritime disputes can be resolved under four different mechanisms. One of them is to bring up the dispute at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which is located in Germany. Later, these cases will be resolved through the arbitration mechanism and hence the matter would be referred to the permanent court of arbitration that is located at The Hague in Netherlands. So after Italy brought up the case at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, an ad hoc arbitration mechanism was constituted under the PCA. So a couple of days ago, the PCA's arbitration mechanism has delivered a ruling in the case which India has decided to respect and abide by. Hence it has asked the Supreme Court to close the pending case. See the awards of the PCA are final in nature but they are not binding on the member states. The award of the PCA is not binding on the member countries because the permanent court of arbitration is not a court in the traditional sense because it relies on the mechanism of arbitration. And moreover, the PCA is not a UN agency. Even though it enjoys the observer status at the UN, it is not an agency of the United Nations. Then the award of the PCA is final because there is no further appeal available after the ruling has been issued by the PCA. But despite this, India has decided to respect the award and abide by the award because it has binding obligations under the UN clause. Because the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea is a UN Convention that has been signed and ratified by India and any country would be obligated to uphold the Convention because it is a part of international law. So under the UN clause, India has binding obligations 
to abide by the award of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and the Permanent Court of Arbitration, even though the ruling of the PCA itself is not binding, and India has conveyed this decision to abide by the award to the Supreme Court. Legal and constitutional experts also believe that this decision of the Government of India is in line with India's constitutional obligations under Article 51. Because Article 51 mandates the Indian state to foster respect towards international law and fulfill India's treaty obligations and resolve and settle all disputes through peaceful arbitration. So in line with these constitutional commitments and in line with the binding obligations of India to UN clause, the Indian government has decided to respect the award of the PCA and the same has been informed to the Supreme Court. This decision of the government also goes on to show that India is a very responsible power when it comes to respecting and upholding international law. In fact, respecting and upholding international law has always been a core foreign policy principle of the Indian government that dates back to the days of Prime Minister Nehru and this has been religiously followed and adhered to by subsequent governments including the current Modi government. Even when some of the decisions of international tribunals have gone against Indian interests, India has chosen to abide by the ruling as a mark of its commitment towards upholding and respecting international law. One such example would be India's decision to accept the PCA's ruling in 2014 related to the India-Bangladesh maritime dispute. When a maritime dispute had emerged between India and Bangladesh over the sovereignty of the New Moor Island and over the delineation of maritime boundaries and exclusive economic zone in the Bay of Bengal, both the countries had decided to approach the PCA as mandated by the UN clause. And in this case, the PCA ruled in favour of Bangladesh and as per the ruling, India had to cede a part of its maritime territory to Bangladesh. But despite the unfavourable ruling, India decided to gracefully accept the award in the interest of friendly bilateral relations with Bangladesh and as well as with regard to India's commitment to uphold and respect international law. In stark contrast to this responsible behaviour of India, the other Asian power that is China has always shown disrespect towards international law. In a case related to the Scarborough Shoal dispute between China and Philippines, the PCA's ruling went in Philippines' favour and instead of respecting the award and abiding by the award as a responsible power, China decided to reject the award of the PCA by stating that the PCA's ruling is not binding on it but in the process, China blatantly let down its obligations to the UN clause. So if you look at India's response in comparison, when the PCA ruled in favour of Bangladesh with regard to the India-Bangladesh maritime dispute and now with regard to the PCA's ruling in the Enrica Lexi case, in both cases, India has gracefully accepted the award in order to uphold and respect international law. So this goes on to show how the expansionist tendencies of China and its irresponsible behaviour at the international level leads to the deliberate erosion of a rules-based order whereas India's behaviour on the other hand shows utmost respect towards international law. Now let's take up a column from page number 6 in which the writers evaluate the selective outlook of the Indian society towards tolerating police violence. The writers take two recent incidents as examples to show how the Indian society shows selective outrage towards police violence. See if you remember last year's horrific gang rape and murder of Disha in Hyderabad, you would know that the Hyderabad police arrested a few suspects a few days after the incident and within a few days they were encountered and the police justification was that they had to kill the suspects in self-defense. This encounter killings of the suspects in the Disha gang rape and murder case was celebrated across the country even though the suspects had not been tried in a court and even though they were yet to be held guilty of this offence by the legal system. See, there is no doubt that the gang rape and murder of Disha was a brutal crime. But seeking instant justice and celebrating such questionable encounters would be a blatant violation of our commitment to the principle of rule of law. See, rule of law is what defines modern societies. See, there are a number of principles that fall under the definition of rule of law. This includes the equal protection and application of law irrespective of the gravity of the crime that has been committed. In a society where rule of law is followed as an unbreakable principle, the judiciary would be obligated to not presume that the suspect is guilty 
unless and until his guilt has been proven by the state that is by the prosecution so if these principles of rule of law are conveniently circumvented for the sake of instant justice and if police violence and possible cases of police excesses are conveniently overlooked by the society in a few selective cases where there is national outrage then it marks our descent from rule of law towards mob justice so even as the investigation continues into the hyderabad encounter our celebration of the encounter as instant justice shows that the indian society is willing to selectively overlook possible cases of police excesses and police violence and this shows that the indian society is willing to let go of its commitment to the principle of rule of law in certain cases and willingly embrace mob justice the writers argue that it has been ingrained in indian society and india's institutional culture and public culture to accept police violence and to overlook police excesses while dealing with suspected terrorists and suspected rapists but on the other hand the toothkudi incident has shown that the indian society shows selective outrage against police violence and police excesses when the victims of these incidents are presumably innocent and not suspected terrorists or suspected rapists or the so called anti nationals so it is this selective outlook of the indian society towards police violence that is criticized by the authors and they go on to argue that the commitment of the indian society towards the principle of rule of law is not principled and instead it is willing to accept and embrace mob justice and even tolerate police violence in few selective cases the writers go on to highlight why it is absolutely essential to put an end to police violence and police excesses and uphold rule of law at any cost by citing some data that has been provided by the national human rights commission and as well as by the national crime records bureau see the nhrc data shows that over the last 3 years around 5300 complaints have been received that are related to custodial debts even if a small percentage of these complaints are genuine it goes on to show the gravity of the situation that we are dealing with the data from the ncrb shows that between 2000 and 2018 around 1727 custodial debts have been formally registered as cases and out of this only 26 police officers have been convicted and held guilty these alarming statistics show how india's criminal legal system has not just failed to prevent police violence and police excesses but instead it has tolerated nurtured and even encouraged the police forces to resort to torture and violence after the horrific toothkudi incident we have discussed in multiple sessions how the indian police have been nurtured and encouraged by the indian society and by india's criminal legal system to resort to torture violence and encounters as an investigative technique so the writers say that if police violence has to be tackled and if custodial deaths have to be prevented and if the responsible police officers have to be held accountable then the following measures need to be taken first and foremost the commitment of the indian society and india's legal system towards the principle of rule of law should be principled and not on the basis of different cases second india's criminal legal system has to be immediately reformed in order to plug the loopholes which are being exploited by the police forces next the government should consider implementing a key recommendation made by the law commission of india with regard to custodial debts the law commission had said that in cases of custodial debts the burden of proof should be placed on the police forces but this recommendation has not been implemented and under the current system the burden of proof lies on the prosecution to prove that the custodial death occurred due to police violence and police excesses next it is high time for india to ratify the un convention against torture india happens to be one of the very few countries in the world that are yet to ratify the un convention against torture and this reflects very poorly on india's global image yes india is concerned about the provisions of the convention being misused on geopolitical grounds to target india because see india is dealing with multiple insurgencies and conflicts in jammu and kashmir in the central and eastern parts of india and as well as in the northeast of india this might push countries that are hostile towards india to deliberately push charges of torture against indian forces in order to corner india on geopolitical grounds but this cannot be the sole reason for india's failure to uphold rule of law and for india's failure 
to prevent police violence and custodial deaths. Next, even though the Supreme Court has passed numerous guidelines that have been designed to prevent custodial violence and custodial deaths and hold the police forces accountable for their excesses, these guidelines are hardly followed leading to the blatant violation of the rule of law. Then finally, the root cause for the impunity with which the police forces resort to torture and violence is their firm belief and conviction that they would be never held accountable for their excesses and crimes. So if this culture of violence has to be arrested, then what we need is immediate police reforms, which would not only hold the police forces accountable for their excesses, but should also make the police force a more humane force. Now let's take up the practice questions for today. In the context of cybersecurity, which of the following sectors or institutions qualify to be categorized under critical information infrastructure? Is it power grids and energy projects? Or banking and financial services? Or telecom and internet? Or air and rail transport? Or the Prime Minister's office? Or the DRDO? Amongst the given options, all the six given sectors and institutions qualify to be categorized under critical information infrastructure. So the correct answer is option D. See, this image has been taken from the website of the National Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center. See, this institution was set up in 2014 as per the provisions of the IT Act based on the recommendations of the National Cyber Security Policy of 2013. This institution functions under the NTRO or the National Technical Research Organization which is the technical intelligence wing of RAW or the research and analysis wing which is India's external intelligence agency. The mandate of the National Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center is to protect and defend India's critical information infrastructure. This is nothing but the IT infrastructure that forms the backbone of critical infrastructure sectors such as transport which includes air transport and rail transport. It also includes power and energy sectors. It includes telecom and internet. It includes sensitive government departments and ministries such as the Prime Minister's office the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of External Affairs, etc. It of course includes the armed forces, the intelligence agencies as well. It also includes banking, financial services such as stock exchanges, insurance, and as well as strategic and public enterprises such as the DRDO, ISRO, etc. So the IT infrastructure, which forms the backbone of all these sectors and institutions, gets classified as critical information infrastructure which is protected and defended by the National Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center under the NTRO. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number one, the Ministry of Power has decided to not import any power equipment from China due to concerns over its vulnerability to cyber attacks. This is because India and Western countries believe that Chinese power equipment come installed with back doors which could possibly allow China to execute cyber attacks on the country's power grid infrastructure by installing malware such as Trojans that could potentially lead to the collapse of the country's power grid. Now let's take up the next practice question. Consider the following statements with regard to the Nagarhole National Park. This protected area spans across Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. It is also a tiger reserve and a part of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. It lies adjacent to the Bandipur National Park and both are separated by the Kabini Reservoir. Amongst the given statements, the first statement is incorrect. So the correct answer is option C, 2 and 3 only. See, the first statement is incorrect because the Nagarhole National Park is located only in Karnataka, not in Tamil Nadu. You can see in this map that the Bandipur National Park and Tiger Reserve and the Nagarhole National Park and Tiger Reserve are two important protected areas of Karnataka that are a part of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve of the Western Ghats. Along with Nagarhole and Bandipur, the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve includes the Mudumulai National Park in Tamil Nadu and the Vainad Wildlife Sanctuary in Kerala. Then you can see in this map that the Nagarhole and Bandipur protected areas are separated by the Kabini Reservoir, which happens to be a very important watering hole in the region that attracts a number of threatened species of animals, including the elephants, the tigers, leopards, etc. This question has been asked because this article on page number 8 highlights the threat posed by vehicular traffic to the biodiversity of the Nagarhole National Park. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? The armed forces of Japan 
have been raised as the Japanese self-defense forces as a result of its pacifist constitution. Japan has a standing maritime dispute with China over the Senkaku Diayu Islands in the East China Sea. The only joint military exercise involving India and Japan is the multilateral Malabar exercise. Amongst the given statements, the third statement is incorrect, so option B is the right answer. See, after Imperial Japan was defeated in the Second World War, the United States forced Japan to adopt a pacifist constitution which mandates Japan to renounce war as a means to settle international disputes and it disallows Japan from developing and deploying any offensive armed forces. That's the reason why the subsequent Japanese governments have raised armed forces in the name of self-defense forces which does not violate its commitments to its pacifist constitution. But the third statement is incorrect because India and Japan have a number of joint military exercises. Both the countries carry out the Dharma Guardian exercise which is a land exercise between the two armies. Then we have the Shinyu Maitri exercise between the two air forces. We also have the Jimex which is a bilateral naval exercise. Apart from this, we have the trilateral naval exercise involving India, United States and Japan known as the Malabar exercise. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 9, Japan is against any unilateral action of China that changes the status quo along the line of actual control. Now let's take up the next practice question. During the COVID-19 pandemic, a medical device that is clipped to the finger to measure the amount of oxygen in our blood has gained a lot of popularity. What is it technically known as? The correct answer is option C. It refers to the pulse oximeter. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 10, the National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority has notified all medical devices including the pulse oximeter as a drug in order to regulate its prices under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940 and the Drugs Price Control Order of 2013 and ensure that the producers and the suppliers do not exploit the pandemic for profits. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which article under the Constitution of India places a limit on the strength of the Council of Ministers? The correct answer is Article 75 and as well as Article 164. So option D is the right answer. See the 91st Amendment Act to the Indian Constitution introduced in 2003 placed a maximum limit on the total number of ministers that could be included in the Council of Ministers including the Prime Minister and the Chief Minister. According to these provisions, the total number of ministers in the Council of Ministers including the Prime Minister and the Chief Minister cannot exceed 15% of the total strength of the lower house. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 11, the Congress party in Madhya Pradesh which is in the opposition has alleged that the Madhya Pradesh government has violated the constitutional provision of article 164 by breaching the limit of 15% on the total strength of the Council of Ministers. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? The Tiwa tribe is an indigenous community inhabiting the states of Assam and Meghalaya and also found in some parts of Arunachal Pradesh, Manipur and Nagaland. They are recognized as a scheduled tribe within the state of Assam. They have also been referred to as Lalums in historical Assamese manuscripts. All the three statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 11, the state government of Assam is reportedly planning to introduce an ordinance that seeks to allow industrialists to establish industries, the two hazardous industries, in tribal areas and forest areas without seeking necessary environmental clearances. Now let's take up another practice question. What best describes the purpose of the Purchasing Managers Index? The correct answer is option B. It is an index of the prevailing direction of economic trends in the manufacturing and service sectors. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 15, the services sector has contracted for a fourth consecutive month as per the purchasing managers index. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2016 prelims paper. The term regional comprehensive economic partnership often appears in news in the context of the affairs of a group of countries known as ASEAN. Option B is the right answer. This is a pretty straightforward question. Finally, 
let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, discuss the challenges in the development of a vaccine and the extent of scientific rigor that is needed in order to ensure its safety and efficacy. The second question, examine the implications and lessons for India arising out of the PCA's ruling in the Enrica Lexi case. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.